Good afternoon. For those of you who've come before, you know I, I start with a quote, and today I'm going to start with two. Within the veil he was born, said I, and there within shall he live, a Negro and a Negro son, holding in that little head, ah, bitterly, the unbowed pride of a hunted race, clinging with that tiny dimpled hand, ah, wearily, to a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful, and seeing with those bright, wondering eyes that peer into my soul, a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty a lie. I saw the shadow of the veil as it passed over my baby. I saw the cold city towering above the blood red land. I held my face beside his little cheek, showed him the star children and the twinkling lights as they began to flash, and stilled with an even song the unvoiced terror of my life. W.E.B. Du Bois of the Passing of the Firstborn from the Souls of Black Folk, 1903. And my second quote. What does it mean to defend the dead? To tend to the black dead and dying, to tend to the black person, to black people, always living in the push toward our death. It means work. It is work, hard, emotional, physical, an intellectual work that demands vigilant attendance to the needs of the dying to ease their way and also to the needs of the living. Christina Sharp in The Wake on Blackness and Belonging from 2015. Welcome to the Black Studies Open University, the spring event series of the Abolition Democracy Fellows Program of the Black Studies Collaboratory housed in the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Today's program, Ferguson Rises, Black Grief, Insurgent Memory, and the Politics of Transfer Transformation has been curated by Abolition Democracy Dissertation Writing Fellow, Rashad Armand Timmons. And it's the fifth of nine events in our Black Studies Open University Spring Series. My name is Lee Rayford. I'm a professor of African American Studies and along with Dr. Tiana S. Pichel, co-director of the Black Studies Collaboratory. The BSC is a three-year initiative to explore and amplify the world-building work of Black Studies. With generous funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's Just Futures Initiative, we have, over the course of the first two years of this grant, welcomed artists, activists, archivists, and elders into the campus community. We have produced a robust event series in partnership with units on campus around the Bay and across the country. We've awarded more than 40 grants of about $5,000 each to students, faculty, and staff, supporting innovative black-centered collaborative projects more than a third of which involve collaboration with off-campus off partners. We have supported the research and development of more than two dozen black feminist scholars around the country and across the globe. And we are building long-term partnerships with black-centered Bay Area organizations that are doing phenomenal work in health, education, art, and food justice. You can find out more about our work at our website, blackstudiescollab.berkeley.edu. We are here at the Berkeley Art Museum at the threshold of the UC Berkeley campus and the city of Berkeley, sited on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Checheno-speaking Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community, both town and gown, has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. In acknowledging the Ohlone history of this land, we acknowledge that the Ohlone people are thriving members of the Berkeley community who are actively imagining more just futures and engaging the tools that are needed to do that imaginative work. 
One way to make concrete such acknowledgement is through the payment of Shumi land tax, a material way for non-indigenous people living in the East Bay to participate in the rematriation of land to, the indi to indigenous people. And you can find out more about Shumi through the Sagaria Le uh, Le Land Trust. So this series, the Black Studies Open University, is an effort to better understand the history of fu and future of black life on stolen lands. Today's panel and series of related events so thoughtfully curated by Rashad asks us how we continue to insist black life into the wake. That is the aftermath and ongoingness of anti-black violence. So the Black Studies Open University is a commitment to black studies as a public good. We are inspired by the legacy of community campus pedagogical partnerships, like the Afro-American Association Reading Group of the 1960s, and the undergraduate-led democratic education at Cal, DECAL courses. We are inspired by SNCC's Freedom Schools and the political education classes of the Black Panther Party, as well as the Oakland Community, Charter, Community School, which we'll be looking at turning to next week. And we take our name from the Open University in the UK, spearheaded by Stuart Hall, whose work provides an example of the pinnacle of intellectual pursuits performed for the public good and in the public interest. So too is the Black Studies Open University a recognition that knowledge is produced, circulated, and put into use in a range of locations from the kitchen table to the seminar room, from the street corner to the concert stage, from the prison cell to the lecture podium. Above all, the Black Studies Open University is an invitation to a mode of study that is always social and necessarily collaborative. It is an invitation to dream together, to fight together, and to practice together for new, more just ways of living. So it's great to see so many folks who've been here before. It's great to welcome people who are here for the first time. We hope that you will continue to join us throughout the, season, the series. Um, before I introduce Rashad, who will be moderating today's panel, I want to thank the beautiful collective of people who've made today and this series possible. The fantastic staff at Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, BSC project manager extraordinaire, Barbara Montano. <laughs> BSC graduate student assistants, Francesca Araujo and Alexandra Gassese. <laughs> the Department of African American Studies, helmed brilliantly by Chair Professor Nikki Jones. <laughs> With incredible staff support from Sandy Richmond, Lindsay Villarreal and Maria Eredia. Our ASL interpreters, Kat and Alina from Pro Bono ASL, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, <laughs> today's panelists, Michael Brown Sr. and Paul Brown, we thank you for making the time to join us. We want to thank the ancestors who are with us always. We thank you for joining us today. And I want to thank Abolition Democracy Dissertation Writing Fellow Rashad Armand Timmons for thoughtfully curating this conversation today. Rashad Armand Timmons is a community builder, a keyboardist, a writer, and black feminist educator from Detroit, Michigan. A beloved child of factory workers, urban gardeners, prayer warriors and musicians, Rashad is a lifelong student of the ways black folks manipulate and adorn the built environment to envision freedom. Rashad is a doctoral candidate in African Diaspora Studies and New Media Studies here at UC Berkeley. Rashad's dissertation explores urban infrastructures as critical sites where the lived social relations that come to define blackness are enacted, visualized, and challenged. 
Specifically, he engages how black subjects in Ferguson, Missouri, reorder sedimented geographies of power by seizing infrastructures as sites of black political insurgency, wake work, tactual, tactual disruption, and sabotage. Rashad's work and care make, make clear the practice that care is the antidote to violence. So Rashad has a special event for us today. This program will end probably at 2.30 p.m. and we will need to vacate the theater right after, but we invite folks to continue the conversation in the atrium just outside the theater. And with that, I hand it over to Rashad Armand Timmons. Thank you, Professor Rayford, for introducing me and making space. And thank all of you for being here today. This is, y'all don't even know. This is remarkable. I'm so appreciative. I hope that as we gather today, you'll reflect on the life and memory of Michael Brown Jr. I hope that you will reconnect with your grief, and I hope that you will feel held in it. Thank you for sharing this moment with me. It's one that I've dreamed of and envisioned for a long time, and it feels so joyous and purposeful to be sharing in it with you. I could spend the entire two hours of our time today thanking folks in this room, and even then, there wouldn't be enough time. And so, if I may, I want to take the time to extend just a few thank yous. First, I want to thank Mike Sr. and Cal for traveling here to be with us, for sharing your light and your pain with us, and for trusting me particularly to convene this way. I know that the work y'all do is work that y'all have done every day since August 9th, 2014. Um, and each day, it does not get any easier, and I don't take that for granted. So I just love you all and appreciate you so much for trusting me to be here and for sharing space with us. I want to thank the Black Studies Collaboratory for making this vision possible, for creating a space for me to dream a radically different world than the one that we have and have inherited, and for creating the conditions for me to live and learn and study an ethical relation with people I love and care about deeply. Um, thinking, learning, feeling, laughing, eating, all of the things with you all has been one of the greatest blessings of my life. And every day I'm so thankful and honored to share it. Finally, I want to thank my partner, Magdalawit, for making space for me to grieve, for grieving with me hard, and for loving me even harder. Um, I love you so much, and your companionship means everything to me. And uh, anytime I get a platform to share it publicly and loudly, I will. Before we move forward, I want to acknowledge the ancestors those who are no longer with us physically, but always powerfully present. Given where and why we gather today, I want to lift up three ancestors in particular.
Kayla Moore. Kayla Moore was and is a beloved daughter, an aunt, a sister, and friend whose life was stolen right here in Berkeley by the Berkeley Police Department in February 2013. Kayla, we love you, we see and adore you, and we feel you all around in the room. Oscar Grant III. Oscar Grant was and is a beloved son, a father, a nephew, and friend whose life was stolen by BART police on New Year's Day in 2009. When I first moved to Oakland in August 2017, I took BART from Fruitvale Station to this campus every day and every evening on my way back home. Oscar was always with me on those commutes and Oscar is still with me and with all of us. Oscar, we love you, we see and adore you and we feel you all around in the room. I made this tweet more than eight years ago after a grand jury in St. Louis County concluded that Darren Wilson's theft of Michael Brown Jr.'s precious life did not warrant any investigation. In many ways, a lot remains the same. My heart is still heavy. Sometimes the tears still fall I'm still striving to move toward a world truer than this one. And I'm still trying my best to stand with Mike Jr. and those who feel his absence the most. But today also feels different. Today, even as the grief feels palpable, I feel full among you all. My 21-year-old self is in delightful disbelief. The young man who authored the tweet that y'all see on the screen could not have imagined a gathering like this one here. Mike Sr. and Cal, when we first met, I told y'all the truth. I've spent the last eight years aspiring to be in meaningful community with you all and you being here now and trusting me to convene this way feels like a dream. But I know that this is reality and specifically a reality where your nightmare has already happened and continues to happen again and again. It is a reality that Audre Lorde writes where it's open season on black children, and our worst lullaby goes on over and over and over. And so I want to say in this public space, in this often nightmarish real life, um, to you here on the historical record that I am embedded, I am honored, and I am ready. I vow to antagonize this world with you. Um, I vow to be a vessel and a comrade in grief and in struggle. And I mean that with everything that I have. And to Mike Mike, a beloved son, a brother, a caretaker, a friend, and someone who, without even knowing me, has changed my life radically. Despite all those who've tried to desecrate your memory, we all know the truth. You are cherished and beautiful. The world knows your name, and we hold it sacred today and always. 
we will defend you by refusing this world. We grieve you, which is another way of saying that we care for you and we love you in the present tense. We remember you and we cannot forget you. Mike, Mike, we love you, we see and adore you, and we feel you all around in the room. So a note on grief. We grieve because we care. We grieve because we love. And we grieve because we remember. I feel a responsibility to say this, to acknowledge grief for what it truly is, an ethical act of care, a radical act of love, and a persistent triumph of memory. When we grieve the black dead and dying, we enact an urgent care for them. We profess a vigilant love over them and nurture a commitment to remember them. Christina Sharp, in her beautiful theorizing, calls the unison of these practices wake work. Wake work, she writes, describes how we attend to physical, social, and figurative death, and also to the largeness that is black life, or black life insisted from death. Wake work describes how we imagine, defend, and care for black lives always already threatened in our present, or the future that chattel slavery made possible. So my research examines how black grief, our commitment to care, love, and remember black life, compels us to imagine a different world. It is broadly concerned with the past and the present and how the built environment around us shapes our experience of race and vice versa. In particular, I study the racial politics of infrastructure. I observe how things such as the pipes that route water into our places of shelter, the cables that carry our energy and information, and the roads that organize our daily movement all shape our experience of geography and race. To put it plainly, my research suggests that by observing how infrastructure functions, when and where it breaks down, when and where it violates or constrains life, we can also observe how race functions in a spatialized in society. And we know this relationship well. Some of the most devastating racial and environmental catastrophes in popular memory were onset by crises of infrastructure and geographic marginality. So does anyone in the room have a sense of where this photo might have been taken and what it might be a picture of? You can call it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm here in Katrina. Yeah, Ninth Ward, New Orleans. Right. So this is an image that was taken in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, Louisiana in 2005. How about this one here? Flint, yeah. Flint, Michigan. So this photo was taken in Flint, Michigan at a hospital, actually, um, in 2014 during the Flint water crisis. Right? So our ability to recognize these images suggest that we are familiar with when and where infrastructures fail and who suffers when they do, right? It reveals how deeply we understand infrastructural violence or how in this case, corroded pipes violate black life and how broken levees facilitate black premature death. 
This relationship explains why infrastructure persists as an object of black political attention and activity across time. Thus, my research also examines how black people perform wake work in and against the built environment, how we disrupt urban infrastructure to reimagine space and reappropriate it to honor and defend black life. Wake work transforms the transit station into a site of memory. Wake work transforms the street intersection into a monument to stolen life. And wake work transforms the street corner into a place of prayer. Wake work or the performance of black grief alters the prescribed functions of infrastructure. And in turn, it disrupts the dominant functioning of race and space that forces us to accelerate and move past black death. Black grief, in other words, brings the anti-black world to a halt. And so a key argument of my work maintains that black grief is a geographic endeavor that demands the transformation of racial and spatial order. The second chapter of my dissertation examines how black grief transforms infrastructure and geography in Ferguson, Missouri. It explores how black grief reorganizes space and becomes embedded in the built environment, so much so that satellites and space can identify scenes of lethal violence and rememory. And in exploring this, my beloved panelists have been the best interlocutors and teachers. And I'm excited to ask them about some of these themes today. Michael Brown Sr. is a husband, father, transformative public speaker, forgiveness coach, and co-founder of the Michael Brown Sr. Chosen for Change organization. After the devastating murder of his son, Mike Brown Jr. in 2014, he embarked on a mission to provide care and support to families processing unthinkable loss. Turning his own pain into power, Michael has dedicated his life to transforming inner city communities through youth empowerment and strengthening mournful families through collective healing. Michael is especially committed to offering radical aid to ailing fathers because their experiences of parental grief are often minimized and discounted by society. Toward this effort, he convenes the organization's Chosen Fathers program to provide a compassionate gathering space for fathers who have lost children to state and police violence. Michael loves to eat cows cooking. Michael loves working on cars. Michael loves spending time with family and friends. And Michael loves creating meaningful change with his village. So I want to welcome, welcome Michael Brown Sr. Cal D. Brown is a wife, a mother, a community healer, a change agent, and a co-founder of the Michael Brown Senior Chosen for Change organization. She is a passionate advocate for families across the world grieving the loss of a child to violence. A firm believer that community care can help parents cope, heal, and reinvent themselves after tragic loss. She co-leads grief support circles resource drives, advocacy campaigns, and youth mentoring programs. These initiatives strengthen heartbroken families and build safer environments for marginalized youth to live freely. Cal loves to cook. She loves spending time with friends and family. And above all, she loves spreading light in her community. Let's please give Cal D. Brown a round of applause.
So we will transition into the panel conversation. And I want to start off this section that I've titled Black Grief and Insurgent Memory, which is a way for us to think about not only black grief, but our commitment to keeping Michael Brown Jr.'s name and legacy alive and uplifted, right? Um, racial domination, as I mentioned yesterday, right, in its most intimate sense, is an assault on our memory, right? It tries to introduce a pain so large that we don't want to remember, or that we plead to forget, or that our minds reach a limit where we cannot remember, right? And so insurgent memory is a way to call in a assault to that kind of order, right? How we continue to keep these names uplifted, how we continue to call in the memory of our loved ones. So I want to begin with a question about Mike Jr.'s life. It's so important for us to remember that Mike Jr.'s life and the lives of other folks who have been stolen by state violence are not reducible to the fatal encounter that made them famous, right? Um, before they were famous, uh, Mike Jr. was beloved and and dear to you all first. And so I want to open with just creating space for you all to share who Mike Jr. was, um, what did he cherish and hold dear, um, what do you love about him, how did he show up in the world for his community and, and for his family. So Mike, uh, Mike was always a big guy growing up. Um, he was very good with his hands. Um, he was a jokester, you know. Um, it's one joke that took him to death before he passed in 2014 uh, on April Fool's Day really didn't realize it was April Fool's Day because I was working and moving around. And, but this guy called me and told me he had a baby on the way and hung the phone up. <laughs> he called me and told me he had a baby on the way and hung up the phone on me. <laughs> I was at work at the time when he called me. I had to have that feeling that whole day until I got off work. Because <laughs> I called him back he wouldn't answer the phone. I'm like, this got to be, it got to be real. If he ain't answering the phone, he just feel like he got it off and, and, and he don't want to talk about it no more, but we're going to talk about this, you know? So I end up talking to him later on that night and uh, I'm like, what's up, boy? What, what, what's this about? You got a girl uh, pregnant? Or He's like, man, daddy, it's, it's April 1st. It's April Fool's Day. I'm like, what? So he got me all day in my feelings, and he just jeffing, you know. So he 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 was very, uh, you know. We used to have water fights in the house, water everywhere, you know. It just we had fun, you know. When Mike was a big dude, we had a pool in the backyard, and he would just jump in, and water just splash all over the kids just standing around the pool, cause he was six four, two ninety, you know. So he was a big guy, you know. Um, he definitely had his own role as far as uh, his life. Um, Mike wanted to be a rapper. I told him, shut that down. You ain't being none of that shit. <laughs> um, but I told him overall, you know, uh, let's get some schooling and uh, just look at that as a hobby, you know. And uh, the day he said that we were uh, out to eat, after he graduated, and uh, I went to the restaurant. He told Cal that the world was going to know his name, and he was going to come back and shake the world. And God damn it, he did it. He did it in a way that I didn't even understand that that's what overall that was going to be. But uh, he definitely impacted the world. He said it's going to be bigger than Pac and Biggie. Um, the world do know his name, I will say that. Um, but in finding himself, he did like uh, working with his hands. So he wanted to go to 
um, Vatarat and do heating and cooling. So um, he had his own plan. And um, Sally was taken away from him. But he was a good guy, man. That was my best man in my wedding. He the one that gave me my ring to give it to her. We don't wear rings no more. But he gave us the ring, you know, to, to pass on. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, you never really heard of someone's son being their best man in their wedding. You know, that, so that just lets people know the relationship that we had, you know or that we still have, because I think about him all the time. I t still talk to him. People think might think that's weird, but I don't care. He's still in the presence of me, you know, so. Um, but that's just a little bit about um, of him from my perspective. Um, I don't know if you want to say something. You want to say something? I do. Okay, cool. Um, ooh, it makes me a little emotional just um, hearing about him. I didn't. I didn't get the privilege of having Mike in my life for 18 years. I only got him for three years. And um, in those three years, he truly made a big impact on my life. Um, within the, the first few months, I was diagnosed with heart disease. And um, I was six months pregnant. And uh, my heart was functioning at less than 25%. So I had to have my daughter, uh, my seventh child, at um, 28 weeks. And um, they told me that I could uh, never work again, and I was a, a nurse at the time. So um, our life completely got turned upside down. Um, Mike had to be the um, breadwinner. And um, because he had to go back to work, he sicked his son on me. <laughs> Cause I was I was deemed to not do anything but just take care of myself, and um, Mike would uh, tell Mike, Mike, I gotta go to work, and I need you to make sure Cal cool. And of course, me being me, um, I'm hard headed. I want to move around and try to do things. He like, hey, my daddy said <laughs> you're not supposed to do nothing. <laughs> I would go in the bathroom and try to have a moment, and here he come, do do do. <laughs> Yes. What you doing? I'm in the bathroom, but you've been in there too long. Like, <laughs> and then I would try to go to the mailbox. He like, no, nah, you can stand in the door and watch me go to the mailbox. And I just remember him being so overprotective, you know, of me. And um, when the summer came, um, the kids were in um, summer camp. So me and him got to, you know, just spend a lot of time together. And um, me and Mike, we connected on a spiritual tip, you know. Um, of course, I told him about the things that I went through in my life, and he like, um, how do you continue to, to serve God the way that you do? And I said, well, one thing I learned a long time ago is favor ain't fair. And God has continued, no matter what I've been through, he's continued to show up over and over again. And so he was um, appalled by my faith after going through so much and um me and mike read the entire bible together and about 60 days before his death we finished it and mike began to speak the gospel to his friends that was actually the stories that they told us you know when we were standing out there august 9th they was like he was telling us all about god you know um i remember um when we when we lost Mike, we were homeless. We had lost everything in a fire a few months before. And um, we went and stayed at my sister's house. And um, he called us, and he was like, what y'all doing? We like, nothing. We just over here chilling. He was like, I got something to show y'all. I'm going to text you something. And when you get the picture, call me back. So we looked at the picture, and it was a picture of a beautiful sunset. And he cut. It had been raining for a couple of days, and it's just, you know, after it rained, how beautiful it is. So he called back. And he was like, y'all see it? And we was like, see what? And he was like, you don't see what's going on in the picture? And we like, we see the sunset. We see the trees. He like, nah, if anybody should see it, Cal, I would think you would see it. So me, him, my mama, the kids, we standing around, and we all looking at this picture on the phone like, what is he talking about? And he was like, look in the right-hand corner. He said, I see the devil chasing an angel into the eyes of God. Mm. Ten days later, he lost his life. And the week that Mike um, was killed, I was in the hospital. 
And um, he called, and Big Mike answered the phone. And they talked for a brief minute. Um, and he was like, Daddy, I got something to tell you. And he was like, uh, what, son? He was like, I don't think Cal going to make it. So his dad got upset with him and got off the phone with him. And when I came in the room from testing, Mike was, you know, all upset and disgruntled. And I'm like, babe, what's wrong? And he was like, that boy, your son. And I was like, what do you do? And he was like, he going to tell me he don't think you're going to make it. And I said, did you ask him why? He was like, no, nah, I got upset and I got off the phone. I said, well, Mike not the type of guy to say something, and I have a reason for it. So that was a Tuesday. That Thursday, they were discharging me from the hospital, and Mike called as I was getting discharged. And he like, hey. I'm like, hey, how you doing? He like, I've been calling you for days, and, you know, you've been out or whatever. His phone was broke. Actually, the picture I just told you about, after he showed us that picture, that brand-new phone never worked again. And um, he like, you know, my daddy upset with me, and I said, well, you know, why? He said, uh, I told him I didn't think you was going to make it. And I said, well, why you say that? He said, because I keep having dreams of death. I see bloody sheets hanging on a clothesline. And when we went out there August 9th, he was under a bloody sheet. Yep. But Mike was a good kid. He was respectful. He was humble. He had love and em empathy for anything that had life. Um, the way that he treated his grandmothers, you would have thought they was his girlfriends. Like, he checked up on them all the time. He made sure they had what they needed. He commuted back and forth from, you know, the both of them. And just the love and the time and the attention that he showed his siblings was just, like, unbelievable. You know, he, he might try to make sure everybody was all right. That's why when I hear the things that the officer says, it's just absolutely unbelievable to me because that's not the person that I knew. Thank you all so much for sharing that yeah, and giving us a, like I tell you all all the time, I'm like, so many ways that we've had an entry point into learning or knowing about Mike Jr. has been from people who never knew him, right? Um, so much about what was written about him, all of the ink spilled, all of the broadcast footage, right, ran, were from people who didn't know his name before August 9th, 2014, right? So it feels truly deep and special for us to get an invitation into knowing him in a different way through you all, right? Um, I want to ask y'all about, yeah, because the things that take, took place on August 9th, 2014 and losing Mike have been scripted and narrated by so many people who did not know him. Um, that has been what has dominated about how we come to understand those events. And I want to ask y'all if it feels comfortable and safe to speak to what are some of the things that you wish people knew about that day or perhaps what you wish people knew about y'all's family and y'all's community in the aftermath of that tragedy. Well, I would say, um definitely that um that they tried to demonize Mike as a human, you know, um and tried to portray him as this just this bad person and this this uh this giant, you know, um, monster. Monster or whatever you want to call it, uh this demon, right? Um <clears throat> the lawyer um actually found footage that was hidden, right? So when the officer wanted to put out the narrative that they wanted out there for the public to see as far as Mike Strong Orman, um, the owner at the at the uh, Ferguson Market, um, what the lawyer did was actually got the same footage because it was on, it happened to get on YouTube and um, he went through it and uh, he, he rewinded the tape, and uh, what he come to find was Mike was in the store at 1.30 that morning. He like, 
what the hell? That's like a jewel, though. You know, so it basically explained why Mike was there, right? So it was a trade between some weed and some blunts that people was to see or check out Ferguson Rises. I mean, Stranger Fruit. I'm sorry, Stranger Fruit is on the Stars app, right? It shows the whole cover up. So if the world just knew that it was an explanation for people that are known for bartering, because that's basically what that was. That's what they do. They come in our community, and we can't afford certain things. We border with them. You know, it's just been since they've been coming in our community, right? Um, and we'll know the truth as far as, like, why the next, well, later on that day, because that is, that's already 8 a.m. when they close, and they open back up in the a.m., right? So people will know that the owner actually didn't know what the nephew and the son does at night. So he was just only going back for what he was owed. And he was going to get that. And it looked it real bad when he was getting it, right? So um, just the truth, actual truth on that, because when um, when they actually put that out there and uh, really didn't have any facts on why he was stopped or anything, they threw that out there to just... Um, to paint the picture of uh, of the person that um, they want the world to see and want the world to understand that this guy was bad, so why are y'all standing up in the street for him? So there was actually a distraction, a distraction to shut it all down. And what it didn't do was it, it it didn't do what they wanted to do. All it did was fuel it, you know. So yeah, that's why I want the especially world to. when the police chief says that Darren Wilson stopping Mike had nothing to do yeah. with the supposed strong arm robbery. Yeah. Darren Wilson didn't even know about what happened in the store. They obtained that video um days after mm -hmm. you know that that's why they withheld his name mm -hmm. because they wanted to try to find something tangible mm -hmm. to stop what was going on. Mm -hmm. And the whole time Mike uh Mike never had a police report. His post lease report is empty. It's nothing on it. But there is a report on the supposed strong arm robbery. Thank y'all for sharing that. I appreciate that. Yeah. I think I'm gonna wait one second, sorry. Yeah. I think it feels important for me to ask y'all what y'all wish people knew, right? Um, instead of what we've been received and given. Um, to close out this section of questions, I, I wanna ask a final one. Um, and I wanna read this one so I make sure I get the quote right. Um, I once heard uh, one of your community members, I wanna say it was Tori, Tori Russell. Um, yeah, he said that Ferguson taught the world how to fight back. Right? Um, and Big Mike, I've heard you talk a lot about, and you too, Cal, learning how to turn your pain into power. Right? Uh, I think both of those processes, right, the using grief to like fuel or compel your will to fight back or turning your pain into power is something I think black folk and marginalized folk and oppressed peoples all across the world are trying to practice and figure it out how to mm. how to make sense of. Um, so I'm wondering if y'all could talk for a moment about how grief has informed your power. Um, and I know y'all have days where it just ain't happening. It's like, this is just, it's not gonna happen today. Um, but y'all keep showing up for the fight, right? And so I'm curious, what the role of grief has been in keeping you all committed to healing, committed to justice, and committed to a different world. Um, grief has forced us um, in the spaces that um, we are in. We didn't have a choice. That's the difference. Um, we didn't. We didn't choose this. It chose us. Um, there's a lot of days um, that there's pushback 
from both of us, but um, because the position we're in, um, it's a must that we continue to show up for the community and show up for um, people who know the pain that we go through. Um, we didn't really get to begin to grieve until um, about the fifth year, to be honest. Um, we were pushed and pulled in so many different ways um, that we really couldn't keep up mentally but physically we kept going because we thought that was what was needed to seek justice and to keep Mike's name out there um this is really um it's a hard pill to swallow um but again I say we've been we've been forced um to grieve forced to take action and most of all um we want to show up because we don't want anybody else to ever have to feel like this. Like, this is something that you wouldn't even wish on your worst enemy, you know. There's not a book on how to grieve. There's not a book on how to cope, to heal, and or reinvent yourself. But we show up in those spaces, and we try to um, teach the people who are in our community to the best of our ability. Even on our, our worst days. You know, um, I do a grief support series called Cookies and Convo, and I've took every class there is on how to deal with grief. And I put an agenda together, and I be excited, and I get in there in a room with all of those mothers and fathers, and it's literally like kryptonite. Mm -hmm. He'll tell you, I have everything planned out, food, the whole nine, and I get in that room, and I see those broken hearts and those somber faces, and it's literally like kryptonite. It drains me, and then I have to pass a task on to the next person and next person. But I done spent weeks putting this together. Like my next Cookies and Convo is March 16th. I have everything down to a T. But the minute I walk in that room, it just takes everything from me. But it's something we have to do because who's, who else is going to do it? Someone who has not been through what we've been through cannot lead spaces like that it happens is it effective in some ways yes but people like mike and people like uncle bobby are not so receptive to it because they like you don't know what i've been through you don't understand my pain you know so um yeah i don't know um every day still different for me you know i <laughs> I get in the mood and just say, I ain't doing nothing. Don't bother me, leave me alone, you know? And I and I feel that I am deserving of that, you know? And I feel like I don't owe nobody nothing, you know? And I feel like I have to still take time off of myself so I can feel better, you know? And I, and I don't ever want to push an agenda of me not being in the right space that day and then still trying to, because I don't want to spaz out, you know what I'm saying? Then the mission, we lose, you know, and uh, I don't want them to win, you know. That's my whole biggest thing. I don't I don't never want them to win to get two licks, two licks off my family like that, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, uh, and that's why I take a lot of time to myself like that because uh, at one point, you know, my my health had changed, man. I was so angry. I'm looking for the, I'm I'm serious. I'm looking for this guy, and I ain't scared to tell the world. I was looking for him, and um, in the in the in the way of not finding him and being so angry and waking up, it started taking a toll on my body. So when my body started trying to calm down from being so amped and mad. My body like, hold on, I ain't felt like that in a long time. What is this? Because mm -hmm. so, it was so round up, like, hold on, what, what, what's this? So I started feeling pain in my chest. Mm -hmm. I say, oh, yeah, you think you're going to win like this? So now I have to get myself together. So if I'm not in the right space, I don't want to overwork myself and end up passing out, dying. And guess what he does? He wins. Y'all so much, man. Y'all please get him a round of applause. We'll transition to you.
Rashad did say this was raw and uncut, so I'm giving it to you. I want to talk a bit about Canfield, um, and particularly, yeah, the importance y'all feel or why it feels important for y'all to continue to show up there, right? So every year, um, Mike and Cal with the Chosen for Change organization, they organize what's called the, the annual Michael Brown Jr. Weekend, which happens um, annually in August. And um, on August 9th, every year, the family convenes the community to come out to Canefield Drive and gather and build a memorial at the site where, where Mike Jr. was killed and left in the street for four and a half hours. And so uh, one of the things that's been most um, just instructive for me is getting to learn from y'all about um, the importance of ritual, the importance of like commemoration, and also y'all's commitment to very tangibly transforming the infrastructure on Canfield Drive, right? Changing the streets, um, trying to create space to congregate and honor the life and memory of your son. And so I wanna ask a few questions um, about that. Um, the first one I want to ask is, I think, just that question, right? Um, uh, why has it felt important for you all to um, show up in the space, right? The space and the site of tragedy, right? To continue to go to that place every year, um, to convene and gather y'all's community there. Um, yeah. First and foremost, we don't want them to forget. The minute we stop showing up in Canfield, they think it's over. So every year, as long as we have the ability and breath in our body, we gonna shut West Florissant down, we gonna shut Canfield down, we gonna disrupt and be disobedient in every way that we can. We have, we have always been respectful of the people who reside in Canfield. And we've always been respectful of the owners. And we go and we sit down with them and we tell them exactly what we're going to do. And, and at this point, they understand that it's in their best interest to agree. <laughs> because if we go back to the community and say, they say we can't come in Canfield, or what is it called now? Pleasant, Pleasant View. Pleasant View. Um, it's going to be a problem every way possible in Ferguson. They've tried to erase what happened to Mike. They changed the name of Canfield. They've taken the tree down. They, they, at one point, they burned a portion of the memorial, and the community came back, and we have continued to show up every birthday, every August 9th. Um, that's, a, that's a sacred space. If you've been out there, you know what it feels like to go stand in, mid in the middle of Canfield. Um, it's really a feeling that you, you cannot explain. Like, you feel his presence there. So as long as his presence is there, our presence will be there. Um, we call that ground zero. That's an important space, not only to us, but to the activists in the community. Many of them slept in tents in the rain, sleet, and cold out there. Um, that is the place that they have congregated for years. You know, show up in that space and shut shit down. And they understand that. Um, that is a place that we would like to change the name of the street and make it a beautiful space um, for the children. But of course, we continue to get pushed back over and over again. And we actually laid off for them for a while because after you do something so much, it gets tiresome. You get weary. But um, we got something for them this year. By the 10 year, they're going to make 
something happen in that space or we gonna make something happen in that space. So uh, I do want to say, um, if it wasn't for the community, you guys would have never seen Mike laying on that ground for four and a half hours. Um, my purpose for going over there, a lot of people don't talk about the tanks either. Um, it's a lot of people who lost their they livelihood, their jobs, they, the way they the way they stay at, because they had to end up putting a curfew up there. And uh, military uh, uniform officers block both ends of the streets off. So if they went in or got off their job at a certain time, they couldn't even come into their home. So um, to to just go back over there and had a chance to pay some bills at one time in in November of 2014 and show our love and, and, and respect to the people that made this big, bigger than big, because if it wasn't for them, <laughs> I just probably would have found out Mike had got killed and that was it. It's always the people that that rises up and, and and show and show love and support for people that they don't even know in different in many ways. And that's one of the ways that the world got a chance to see truth and we were able to uh make a, a, a big a big um <laughs> some big noise behind it, you know. Um and and um in rep rep representation for all the other ones that has been killed in St. Louis that was thrown up under the rug. So um, you know, for for the community to stand up like that, you know, that's that's what we have to do. You know, we have to stand with them, and and I'm proud to be a part of them too. You know, so I work don't stop. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I uh. I'm glad that you brought up that they were barricading the streets off because that's something that people don't know and it made it really difficult for people to leave and come in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's getting to some of the things that I was talking about earlier with this idea around infrastructural violence, right? You can like literally control the infrastructure and really disrupt people's livelihoods, right? Um, and even in the design of the space, right? Um, yeah. I walk the same sidewalks, right? That's on Canefield, and those sidewalks are not walkable, right? Um, uh, I talked with Dorian Johnson, uh, Mike <clears throat> Jr.'s friend who was with him, right? And he was like, man, like, we was just walking back from the stove, chilling, kicking it. And, like, if we wanted to actually be able to chill and kick it and share space with each other, we didn't have enough space over there. We just walked in the street like everybody always do, mm -hmm. right? Um, so those kinds of things, right, how the design of the landscape also facilitates these points of contact and encounter between police and, and, and black people. Um, so I love that y'all have talked about, right, like, yeah, there are these ways, right, that we, um, the space gets imposed on us in these kinds of ways, but we also get to show up and make sense of how this space works for us and how we get to live and inhabit it, too. Um, so I just am so appreciative for y'all sh for sharing that. And um, the final question I'll ask in, in this section um, before we talk about Chosen for Change, I, I just wanna ask and give y'all a chance to talk about the vision that y'all have for Canfield. Um, yeah, y'all have been petitioning and demanding right change to the infrastructure on Canfield since 2014. Right, um, and particularly, y'all had put together a petition, right, to the mayor and to the council members, like one, to rename Canefield Drive to Michael Brown Jr. Boulevard, right, two, to um, install a permanent median, right, in the section of the street where Mike Jr. perished, right, that there would be a memorial place there and a marker place there, and then also at the intersection of Canefield and Caddyfield, um, which is diagonal to the site where he, where he perished, um, the installing of a green space, right, and a roadside marker. Um, and when I like, learned about that and found out about that, I just thought that that was so um, <coughs> deep and beautiful, right, to think about 
how you all wanted to transform that space to be more accommodating of loving and honoring and celebrating him, right? So I wanted y'all to talk a little bit by, about the motivations behind some of those visions, right? Like why change the name? Why install a median? What's the significance of that? Um, and you talked a bit about the pushback, Cal, but I hope y'all could talk a little bit more about what's the status of the vision and what are y'all pushing for moving forward? More than anything, we wanted um, Canfield to be a safe space. It, you've been there before. They fly up and down the street, and it's just really not a safe space for um, the children. Um, that be one of the reasons that um, Mike and Dorian were walking down the middle of the street. That particular summer, the street, the trees was grown over, mm -hmm. over the sidewalk. So you would have to, at some point, go into the streets. Um, the infrastructure aspect of it, we talked about that like like early on with um, people in the community, and they all actually had input on you know what they wanted to it wanted it to look like. Um, we just wanted it to be a safe space, a beautiful space, something that was um, befitting in the honor you know of Mike. Something so ugly happened in that space, so it only made sense to transform it into something beautiful. Um, We've had major pushback. Um, we knew racist knows wasn't gonna give us nothing. Um, actually, the um, the owner of the prior owner of Canfield Lip, Lipton Lipton said his exact words was, "Who the hell would want to live on Michael Brown Jr. Boulevard?" And we was like, "Wow, really?" He was like, "Would nobody?" I said, "Why wouldn't they? Look at what happens there." what happened there and he was just like he pretty much wanted to erase what happened in that space and that's one of the reasons he's he, he sold a property because he like I don't really want to deal with them and I see that they're not going to stop they're going to keep coming back every year over and over again so he sold the property and Lipton has owned it probably since the beginning for decades yeah so I feel like that was a success in pushing, you know, Lipton into selling. Um, the the new owners are more receptive. There's some pushback, but I think the pushback is more from the city, mm. like um, the current black mayor, Ella Jones, who say she's for the people, but she ain't for our people because Mike Brown Jr. got you in that place. Mm. There is no other reason why you was elected in that place and in that space, and you're going on with their years of agenda by not helping us do it. Mm -hmm. But we gonna she gonna have a seat at our table because we gonna bring the table. Yes. This go round. Yes. Yeah. So me personally, I feel like it's very important <clears throat> because we have. Uh, we have a lot of people that travel to Canfield, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have the right information out there for people because we still do travel. So we used to have people like call us, like, "Hey, we just seen a busload of people going down Canfield. We know they finna hop out. Can Where you here? guys at?" And we half of the time we out of town. So um, and and two, you have uh, residents that's there that <laughs> will come out and act like they know what was going on and uh, mislead mm. the people. So we definitely do need uh, markings and information for people that just want to know what this walk down this street was that day from point from A to Z. Mm. And they can kind of relive it, you know, um, with with the emotional part, you know, to understand. With the correct you know, information. The correct, yeah. So, um that's something that we definitely we definitely need to get done um, as soon as possible because, like I say, people are in and out trying to just you know and they and then it doesn't have any type of contact uh, information to even try to reach us to um, to even try to have a conversation about those things you know what I'm saying because we can send a representation mm -hmm. person down there if we can't make it but we don't really even know when they're or even yeah. there. We will hear about it later, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that's fair. 
you know, so we have to do something for the, the community to be able to understand and get a, um, a, a vision of what that day was, 2014. Thank y'all. Um, I'm gonna take a second for them to transition and I'll uh, click us to the next portion. So yeah, this space, I, I just wanted to open it up for y'all to talk about the work that y'all are doing with the Chosen for Change organization. I know we kind of mentioned some of the programs, right? I talked about Chosen Fathers in the introduction. We talked about Cookies and Convo, right? And so I wanted to talk about the work y'all are doing to transform Canfield. So I wanted to open it up and give y'all um, space to talk about the organization, its work, its mission, um, and ultimately how people can can support and find their way into the work. Mm -hmm. We are the Michael Brown Senior Chosen for Change organization. We provide care and support to fathers and family processing the unthinkable and abroad. Um, we have a new program that we will be launching in May of 2023 called First 48. We feel like this program um, is very important. Um, I know there are some people who briefly, you know, do the work here and there, but it's something that needs to consistently happen because grieving families are constantly disrespected, disregarded, and most of all mishandled in the most vulnerable time in their life. And I think that it's unfair. And, and we were able to, to decide on doing this by the way that we were treated, you know, when we lost Mike. A lot of the times people get so entangled in the person we've lost and they forget about the people who are left behind. And when you lose a child, you just about lose your damn mind. And you need people around you who are safe, who are honest, who have your best interests at heart, want to make sure you have the proper resources to make sure you're being um, handled properly when it comes to law enforcement because if I I think back Mike and Leslie didn't even get to identify their son's body the next time they saw their son after August 9th was two weeks later at the funeral because of the cover-up and the lies and the lack of their other because there's not a book on how to lose your child. Nobody knows what to do when they lose their child. So it has to be someone in the community that you trust who shows up, who is strictly there for you, not for their own agenda, not for all of that other mess. That is a very important and sacred space after you lose your child. So the first 48 will deploy people who we trust and who have been trained in grief support in the community within the first 48 hours of someone losing their loved one. We focus on the parents losing their children, but a loss is a loss. So if you call us and, and you say you've, somebody says you've lost someone, we'll show up in those first 48 hours and do the things that I said prior. We will be there the first 48 days and the first 48 weeks because grief is something that does not get better over time. So if we go 40 weeks, 48 weeks in, you've already went past your first year, and the first year is the hardest year. If it is state-sanctioned violence, we will stay with you until um, justice is served. Um, even though we have those key points, first 48 hours, first 48 days, first 48 weeks, that doesn't mean we'll leave then, but those will be the intricate times that we will be available to show up with the things that um, that is needed. Um, as I said before, so many people get so tied up with the people that they lost and forget about those who, who are left here. You know, um, grief is, it, is something else. And it just, it doesn't. Uncle Bobby and A.B. can contest to that and many others in here. People say it get better in time. I don't know who came up with that quote, but it's a damn lie. Because now you get time to miss them. I missed his birthday. 
He liked Easter. He liked Thanksgiving. This was his favorite food. So a year in, you really besides yourself because it's been a year that you have not had that person in your space and been able to be there for them. So I challenge people to show up in a special way for these parents who have lost their children. So many people come with their own agendas and they raise money behind these people losing their children. Yeah, like like it's 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 absolutely disgusting how people do that. At the time, we're not thinking about money because we want justice. Or furthermore, we want our loved one back. But you have people who have the time to do some of the most sickening and the disgusting stuff while people are vulnerable and grieving. Like, I literally feel like it should be a law against this shit. Like, for real. Because we travel and we see this happen over and over and over again. And nobody is stopping it. But you know what? When we drop first 48, that's how we're going to pull up. And people are going to be upset because we're going to show them the door. Like, why are you here? Why do you feel like you need to be in this space? What can you bring to this space to help? You finna put them in a hotel for the next 30 days? Her baby got killed in her house. She can't dare walk back in the house. So what are you going to do to make sure it's safe for them? And one of the bigger reasons that we we felt this was needed there was a family a few years back who um, lost their child, and they were absolutely furious with the with the activists, and the activists didn't really know why. They was like, we've done everything. He said, I can buy my own food. I can buy my own clothes. I, I got a home. He said, but what I needed was so, for somebody to go out there and clean my baby's blood out that van that I got to drive my family to school and work with. Often when this happened, nobody asked. What do you need? What is it that you specifically need? Nobody asked us what we was needed. We was homeless with eight kids in a hotel. And where did y'all visit us at? In a hotel. And nobody said, what do y'all need? They gave us money. They put us up in hotels. They gave us little trinkets, but nobody knew. We didn't have a house to live in. And those are the important questions that, um, that need to happen right on. You know, and we need to make sure that these people are not being ha mishandled and that they are safe. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that that's really important to me. Like, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I didn't I didn't lose my biological child. So I was able to take a step back and really pay attention to what was going on. My husband used to fuss at me like, why do you always walk behind me? Because I can see all the messed up shit. I can see how people looking at you. I can see the things that people saying. I can see the things that people doing. So I'm a lot more knowledgeable than Mike is because I stood in the background. And he thought it was disrespectful because he feel like I should be behind you. Nah, I'm your reinforcement. I got your back. And that's one of the things that I have did for the last eight and a half years is to pr to protect my husband at all costs. I ain't have a lot, but I'm smart as hell. And uh, yeah, and, and that's what I got the brains behind is. He got the pain and I got the brains, you know. Oh, that kind of rhyme. That's new. <laughs> We, we have another program called Chosen Fathers. Um, we create a space for fathers to heal, bond, and grow. And Chosen Fathers came from when we were in Cleveland after Tamir Rice. And um, BLM brought all them families out there, but that's another thing. Um, they was walking down the streets in Cleveland. And I was behind them, as I always am. And I listened to each one of these black men express they hurt and they pain. And I literally was walking down the street in Cleveland, like in tears. And Mike was like, what's wrong? I was like, bro, you did not hear what I was hearing. It was Mike, Uncle Bobby, Ron Davis, Andrew Joseph. I mean, it was a bunch of them. And I was like, we got to do something. I said, you see how they've silenced you and they've pushed you to the back? Like your pain ain't matter. You ain't the only one that feels like that, you know. So we came up with Chosen Fathers, and we had the first retreat in, no, 2016. Yeah, in 2016, and we took 20 
20 fathers to a secluded space in Union, Missouri. And when I tell you these men had uh, the time of their life, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just was like, I know what I thought felt good. I know what I thought that my husband needed and wanted. And if you could just see the, the video of these black men when they opened the gifts, you know, the gifts that really came from my heart, like... It was breathtaking, and, and a lot of them had never cried. You know, black men are told not to cry. So a lot of these men have taken that through their life. And um, one particular, Von Derrick Myers um, Sr., his son, Von Derrick Myers Jr., was killed about 60 days after um, Mike Jr., and um, he had never really grieved or cried over his son because he was so angry. And I don't know if you've seen in... Um, Ferguson Rises, a lot of people had on ties that had Mike's Jr. face on them. And all the fathers kept saying, I want one of them ties. I want one of them ties. And I was like, why would I get him a tie? I know why I would give him a tie with Mike on it. But a better gift would be a tie with their own son on it. And when I tell you, when these men, I put it in a little a royal blue Chinese box. I always kind of color code things. and it, So they looking at these boxes like, they try, this Chinese food boxes, and they holding them, and they talking, and when they open the boxes and they pull these ties out, like, it was, yeah, like the whole room lit up. You had Kerry Ball Sr. in the corner hollering. You had Ron Davis crying, Uncle Bobby, like, they was just like, oh, my God. And that's just the, the type of space that I, I try to have for them because um, our black men, they carry the weight of the world. And then you got people that want to throw the moon and the stars and Jupiter on their back as if they don't carry enough. So I just try to get them a space of healing, a space where they don't have to worry about being the man of the house or, you know, taking care of their everyday things. So we try to just give them three or four days where they can just be them, worry about them, have the space to uh, just release. And it's just, it's, it's, it's really an honor to be a part of that space. Um. <laughs> oh, and it get a wife's a break for a couple of days too. <laughs> um. We also have a program called the SWAT Team. It's Mike Jr.'s uh, sisters. Um, after they lost their brother, they wanted to be able to have a voice as well. So they go out in the community and they mentor, they do philanthropy, they show up and volunteer at events, they go to the nursing homes, paint fingernails, bake cupcakes. Like um, They really do their thing. We took them to Essence in 2017. And uh, it was quite impactful. Like, they were able to tell people the things that they wanted to do and how they wanted to show up. And we took 500 T-shirts to Essence. And within 24 hours, every T-shirt was gone. And um, they like, what are we going to sell tomorrow? And one of them was like, well, Cal, why don't you do your lemonade? So literally, I was at Essence under a table mixing <laughs> the famous Made With Love lemonade and... <laughs> And you had people like coming up, you know, because it's free lemonade and people were leaving tips and people would drink it. And they was like, what the heck? What is, what is this? And we like, May will love lemonade. So it, it's got his famous name, uh, that crack juice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in which my 10 year old currently has a business doing. Um, and she is their little uh, mascot for the SWAT team. So they're rebranding and restructuring, and they should be relaunching um, this, uh, I believe, June. And then we have grief support for children. Uh, children are often left uh, behind. People so focus on the parents, they forget about the children who now don't have their sibling that they grew up with anymore. So we have a program called COPES. Children Overcoming Painful Experiences with Support. So uh, we will be launching uh, that soon as well. Am I forgetting anything? I talked about Cookies and Convo. Mothers of an Angel. Mothers, mothers of an Angel. Mothers of an Angel St. Louis also creates a space uh, for women to heal, bond, and grow. Um, I was forced into 
creating this um, space because uh, it just really wasn't a space for the women in St. Louis. And um, they was kind of jealous of the men. I heard about it all the time. They like, they going on trips all over the world. Like, you know, what about us? So two years ago, I launched Mothers of an Angel um, and it has been a successful um, program. I put a post out asking for, um, what was it, 40 women and... Um, no, I actually ended up getting 336 names, like in a two-week period. And I said that just to show you the need that is there for those um, type of spaces. So uh, actually, our next Mothers of an Angel event is coming up Mar uh, May 7th. That is Bereaved Mother's Day. A lot of people don't know that the Sunday prior to Mother's Day is Bereaved Mother's Day. So if you know a mother who is bereaved, that is a day for... Um, you to show up for her, take her some flowers, um, give her a phone call, take her to lunch, dinner, you know, because um, that is the day that is specifically for them. Um, you said how to support. Yes. Uh, so um, you can go to chosenforchange.org. That is our new, um, that'll be our new website that we'll be launching soon. And you can see, um, you know, all of our work. But if you want to see what we've done prior, you can go to the michaelbrownfoundation.org. You already told my program, so. <laughs> so I am. Um, you know, uh, I'm the face of uh, Chosen Fathers. Um, the uh, Chosen Fathers group was put together um, by me and Cal first. Oh, we thought of it. Um, but I have local fathers and national fathers in this group, you know. Um, and uh, I've seen um, the same pain in these fathers' face that I had uh, in mine. And... Uh, I was always told that I was uh, not selfless, you know. So um, I'm always looking for looking out for other fathers and families, and you know. Um, so I brought a bunch of them, you know, with me with, uh, on the journey, you know, to trying to heal or trying to have a better day. So we have a line, um, a text line that we we talk on every morning. We tell each other good morning. Um, any give give me any type of encouragement words you know um, any type of information that's coming up uh, we put it in there so we all can get it so we do a lot of communicating you know uh, and uh, the mothers of an angel got jealous about that you know we had to come to some of their group they groups and uh, show them how to uh, grieve so you know. Um, we have one brother might start crying or something like that and we all just come up and hug them. And these women would sit back and look at us like, what the hell are they doing? They we sitting here like teaching y'all what should be done when we going through something like that. You don't just sit there and let your, your neighbor cry and you just look at her. Y'all are sisters, you know, in the same fight. You get up, you hug her, you console her. You know, so we had to come in and show the women how it get done, <laughs> which is cool, you know, because we all have to still heal together, you know. Um, but yeah, that's my program, you know, um, it, it definitely, uh, helps me on bad days, good days, you know, uh, just, it's just a light on all of them, all of my, my, my days going forward, you know, uh, if they good or bad, you know, uh, you heard talks about, I ain't having a good day in there and then you just see all these floods of brothers just giving words of encouragement. You know, we definitely need that because, like the wife said, you know, we hold a lot of stuff on our back. And we were taught to take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. And how much are we going to take until we explode? So we have to get it out. So this is one way we are able to release. I want to make sure that we have time for y'all to ask some questions too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think we'll transition to audience Q&A, but before we do that, I do wanna close our conversation first by just saying thank you. Oh my goodness, 
Thank you. Oh, oh my goodness. Bro. Oh, my goodness. We, we met Rashad August 9th of 2022, and now he my road dog. <laughs> look, we've been talking... Look, every week for some months, like, like my Mondays are my uh, my depressed days. Like, you know, I try to get every, decompress. yeah, decompress. And I told Rashad the best days was Monday. So every Monday at 8 at noon, we talk. And I, we be in there laughing and talking. And Michael be like, who is you talking to? I be like, this Rashad. He be like, oh, yeah, they going to be on the phone for a minute. We supposed to talk for what? 45 minutes, yeah. that has not happened yet, like literally. And um, I've grown to love him. He's just as sweet as he want to be. And I thank you so much for being passionate about the work. He said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to get you out of Berkeley. And, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. We definitely be on the phone cracking up. Um, before I close this part, I want to... Uh, take 45 seconds to yeah have y'all um either silently or aloud just be able to address mike jr um yeah and that might be something that you want to say for the recording it might be something that you just want to say internally to yourself um but i do want to close by opening space for y'all to address him and y'all to have a space to convene in and talk to him. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would say this, this boy I always knew how I felt about him, you know. I I will whew, man, that's why it's just I am talking to him. I'm, we are I am him, he is me. <laughs> Um, I just want to tell you, man, you know, you know how I feel about you. You know, uh, I miss you. I love you. Um, I'm going to fight this fight to the day I die. Um, it's crazy. I still got your clothes, a lot of your clothes. I got to smell them, man. I, I got to, I got to feel your presence more than just spiritually. I got to smell it, you know? So I still got your clothes, man. Uh, Got all the pictures, you know, I I got everything that was left behind, you know. Um sadly you still not behind, but I'm I'm working, boy. And I'ma forever work and honor you. And I'ma definitely let these devils know that I ain't stopping. And if they want that work, you know your daddy give them that work. So that's my last talk to him, right here. I gotta use the bathroom. <laughs> uh, we talk quite often. Um, I fuss at him a lot, cause he left me with a hell of a journey. And he left me with this knucklehead. <laughs> but um, I'm here for it. For a long time, I um, I didn't really understand what my purpose was, and I didn't understand a lot of the things uh, that I went through in my life, and I soon figured out that it was pre to prepare me for this moment, to be able to, to be here for your dad and to stand up for you and to continue to push your legacy. Um, I love you. I wish you I, I could hold you and kiss you. But I know you'll tell me you don't do that gay stuff and give me some dap. <laughs> Thank y'all for doing that. Yeah. Thank um, you for giving us the space. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe two questions. Okay. Um, here's one here in the center. Sorry, what you say? I'm trying to see. 
Oh, no, they have, they have them. Are they? Is a mic out there? Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, hey, my name's Will. I really appreciate your talk. And you said something at the start, Rashad, that, that, that grief reorganizes space. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about the classroom and how for a lot of young black kids, the classroom is a political space. They get excluded from the classroom. They get segregated to special education. They get segregated to alternative education. They get punitive behavioral challenges, told they're bad. And you mentioned the kind of, the, the, the structural rumors around him, them trying to label him a certain way. You mentioned the term like his size, he's a giant and whatnot. And I'm thinking a lot of this stuff happens when these kids are really young. And so I'm wondering, we're at a university now where sadly, but knowingly, there's a complete absence of black student population. And so I'm wondering, not necessarily how can we address that, but for you to speak to us, right? This is a brilliant opportunity here in open university, but the rest of the space is like vapid, it's void, it's violent. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering at, the, at this core, as you are showing how human of a person your son was. I think you're also showing how human and a person black kids are in general. Yeah. And I wanted to just hold that because I think it was really beautiful and it's really needed. And outside of this space, this whole place is void in it. And we lose that. So thank you so much. Thank you. You have a question? Here in the front. Yeah. Oh, I have it. Yeah, I'll be. I just wanted to, this is for Cal and Mike, but uh, I know you talked about um, people coming in the space, how important it is. And, and thank you, Rashad, for coming in, not wanting something, but to give something. Yes. And I just want to say, we work with a lot of families, right? So we know how important it is. And so when we met Mike and Cal, um, it was the 10th of August? August 11th. It was the 11th of August. Yes, it happened. Yeah, it was on a Monday. Monday? Right. And um, just, we all clicked automatically. It's, we've been here day one, right? But we all know that people come in the space and they always want something. It's always, so how important it is and how uh, was it that you were able to decipher that? Because we know that we have a lot of families that do not decipher there. And the trauma that you people put on these families by doing that, that's one of the biggest causes for families to close up and not fight. It's because people come in the space to use and abuse their pain. Let me talk about that. Well, we didn't we didn't decipher right off. It actually took us some time because um when you're overcome with grief, you don't really see the signs. Um I don't know how did we decipher like it did stuff. So, you know what, what, <laughs> it so while we were so while we were grieving and going through things, right. it was people getting being becoming millionaires off our pain. Oh, that part. So uh, the disrespect was slapped in our face when we weren't ready for it. So the way we found out about it, we started trying to get uh, domain names and stuff like that, uh, uh, names and Mike's and Mike's names, and come to find out these things had already been bought, and it had money. You know, people were getting money off these names and stuff like this, and we like, how did people even have time to even research or do this? Of course they did. While the family is not paying attention, we're going to go up under them, and we're going to rake this money in. So those are the things or some of the, the devilish things that people could come in and, and portray or infiltrate that they're there for you, and they come to steal up under you, you know. So we just want to have those 
uh, be in positions like that for other families so they could be aware of uh, vultures coming into their life when they're going through pain. But we can't lead them thinking that it's just everyday people do it, that do it. Preachers, lawyers, leaders. They, 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 some of the main ones that we have to protect these grieving families from somebody like us and Uncle Bobby and Drew, and them people who are passionate and real, got to show up first to let them know that might not be the road that you want to go down. It's people that we trust who end up being the ones. You know what I'm saying? That hurt us. So it's it's really important to have people in those spaces because when you when you lose, as I said before, you literally just about lose your mind. You don't know your head from your tail, and you need somebody there that's going to that's going to guide you through those those first moments and beyond. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, please, Uncle Bobby. Yes. Um, well, first, I am Oscar Grant's uncle, um, and I heard Mike say it's uncommon or not elevated to the point where we have our son be our best man. Wow, Mike, after all these years, I didn't realize that Michael Jr. was your best man. Because for me, Oscar Grant was my best man. Along with my son, you know, I can't leave him out. But the, the point is this. The, 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 the point is this, yeah, because this is on record. And he'd be like, hey, Dad, I was there too. <laughs> but, right. But the significance of that is that, you know, we bonded, sadly, through the blood of our loved ones being murdered. Uh, but what has sustained us, uh, I think, through the years is the fact that we love each other. And we share a similar experience, unbeknown to us. You know, because even in Oscar's death, prior to his murder, like Cal, Oscar, tech, Oscar was on my spirit. Let me just share this. And he was so heavily on my spirit on New Year's Eve, you know, because I'm really in the bed. He's out having fun. I texted him. I said, Uncle, love you. God loves you. God loves you loves your family. And an hour and a half later, he was murdered. Had I had not responded in a text to him, you know, I talk about how angry I was, I would still be in an anger today because I'd be mad at myself. And we talk about forgiving ourselves. But I would have been mad at myself for failing that. So that's just a, a message to all of us that if any loved one is on your heart or in your spirit speaking to you and you asking the question, why? Respond, because that may be your last opportunity to share that message of love. Mm -hmm. So, wow, thank you, Rashad, for pulling that out of Mike and him revealing that to us. Because we've been on panels together, but somehow your spirit and the questions and the way that they were asked pulled stuff out of Mike and Callie that's been powerful. So thank you both. Yeah, this been the best. <laughs> thank you, Uncle Bobby. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank y'all so much. Um, we are getting close to 2.30, um, but before I invite Professor Rayford back up to close, um, I do um, want to close with an offering. Um, Mike and Cal, when we talked a few months ago, um, we had had a conversation and I told y'all that as, as black people, our radical visions deserve to be brought to life, right? To come to life. Um, and uh, yeah, a month or so ago, I had a vision and a dream that uh, the community of people that you see gathered here today um, would be here and be present and to be able to verbalize and make tangible their support for you, their love for you, um, their commitment to you and to honoring the life and memory of Mike Jr. So at the outset of Black History Month, I launched a campaign to raise $10,000 in the recognition of the upcoming 10th anniversary of Mike Jr.'s death. And I was scared because I had never raised any kind of money like that before. Um, but I knew 
And what you all have shared and teach us so deeply is that our community is greater than our fear, right? Um, our community is the antidote to our fear. And so I'm so happy and honored to have all of these folks gathered in the room, many of whom uh, donated and contribute to this campaign and realized this vision and made it real. Um, and I'm happy and honored to be able to present y'all with uh, actually more than $10,000, $10,708.33. <laughs> Thank you all. We are just about at time. I, um, y'all have nothing to add. Just thank you, gratitude. Thank you, Michael Brown Sr., Cal Brown for being here. Thank you, Rashad, for bringing us together in the most beautiful way. Um, Community is the antidote to violence. All right, hopefully we'll see you all next, next week um, for our panel. Let's see if I can find it. Oops, there we go. Educate to Liberate, a photographic time capsule of the Black Panther Party's community education programs unveiled. 4,000 new photographs recently found, which we'll be exploring next week. Thank you all, and please join us in the atrium.